start off, I'd like to ask everyone here to first envision your sixth grade self. <laughs> and I know that this might be going back to a fairly dark time for many of us, but if you can stomach it, just remember what it was like, what you wore, what you did on the weekends, what you were obsessed with. And if any of these memories are making you cringe a little, I'd just like to stand here as a source of reassurance. Because this was I in the sixth grade. Oh, Skiles and I. That was I. <laughs> For Halloween, I decided I was going to be the travel loss, as you know. <laughs> God knows why, but I did. Uh, the worst part, though, of this photo is this was taken directly before I could tell you dance. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I will say, though, I was in the car and I sort of realized my situation before I got out and I resolved to take off the beard and so I was in that, just that blue buckle thing, walking around making everyone probably very confused and concerned for my mental state. And if I recall correctly, the majority of my grade that year was dressed up as these really cute M&Ms. They had black tights on and colored shirts with M's on them. And my mom kept asking me if I wanted to be an M&M &M too, clearly trying to warn me of my decision. But I was very adamant about being a gnome. Very adamant. That is what I wanted to do, and so I went for it. Cool. <laughs> and I did come home later that night feeling so dumb and wondering to my mom why she ever let me leave the house and just laying face down on the bed, mumbling why you <laughs> did this happen. <laughs> but I ultimately gained a really fond memory from this experience and my family and friends and anybody who's seen this photo previously all laugh about this now. For, for instance, I'll be in one room, silently working, doing my thing. My mom will be in another room. I'll hear her start to laugh, and I will look down at my phone to see that she has sent me this photo. <laughs> um, I think, though, that the funniest thing to me about this picture is that I still very much so am this person. Um, I'm not necessarily talking about my offbeat love for garden gnomes, because that is an entirely separate tangent. We can talk after. <laughs> but, um, I am talking about this part of my character that desires of anything else to pursue a dream or an idea rocketing around in my head. In sixth grade, that dream was to be a gnome. And about a year ago, in the dead center of sophomore year, that dream was to get well out of the environment I was comfortable in and create an adventure. Sophomore year, though, was by no means the first time I had dreamed of adventure. For as long as I can solidly remember, I've had all these big schemes of tra traveling to every conceivable place and exploring each unique nook. If you were to see the bookshelf in my room, it would be completely yellow from spine after spine after spine of National Geographic magazine. Um, so while sophomore year doesn't mark the start of my adventure dream, it does mark the start of the first time I, as an individual, took my life into my own hands and decided to go after something that I felt passionate about. And <coughs> I didn't know what this something was in sophomore year. I really didn't. But I knew that I wanted it. And I also knew that if I wanted to keep myself from being a fugitive of the law, I probably should refrain <laughs> from going off completely on my own, <laughs> dropping school and just running around the world like I wanted to. Um, so I went off in search of a program that would allow me to stay out of jail, but also allow me to explore part of the world I had not yet seen. January 6, 2014, at 12.03 in the morning is when I found that something I had been so looking for. I had been looking at high school study abroad programs when I clicked on a page detailing semester schools and I didn't know how this program works but I went through and I clicked and I was looking, there were some in the Bahamas, some in other countries and I thought they were cool, yes, but none of them really clicked with me until I scrolled to the bottom of that page and I clicked on the very last link, <laughs> funny how the homer seems to work, and I think I was on the site of that particular program for about four minutes before this feeling just landed in my gut, and I can't really articulate to you why. I don't even know myself, but I knew that I wanted it, and the only conceivable response I could make was to go after it. Um, I mean, this photo, that's still there. Oh, it's today. Okay, there we go. <laughs> to give you some background, the name of the school is the High Mountain Institute, located in Leadville, Colorado. 
Leadville is situated around two hours up from Denver and two hours away from Aspen, so basically right smack in the heart of the Rocky Mountains. The school was founded by two Knowles instructors, and for those of you who aren't familiar with the acronym, Knowles stands for the National Outdoor Leadership School. And this couple in 1998 had this dream to build a school specifically for juniors um, using the Knowles outdoor-based curriculum of leadership and communication to foster a community of young people they could pass on their love of nature and exploration to. I'm not sure how they chose the town of Leadville as it is more of a one street type town. <laughs> Very tiny, um, but you really hardly have any time to notice because the second you come off the highway and you round this little bump, you're greeted by the two tallest mountains in Colorado, Mount Elbert and Mount Massive. Mount Massive is 12 feet shorter than Mount Elbert, so I mean, <laughs> but there are some seriously impressive 14,000 foot rocks. Living in Leadville is as close to the sky as I have ever lived. The high, it is the highest elevated city in America. The town itself sits about 10,152 feet above the sea. The school focuses on teaching juniors in high school in either the spring or fall of their junior year, so I participated in my fall semester. Um, not only how to travel and backpack comfortably, but how to be a leader and communicate effectively and build and foster community that you care for. We, as part of the curriculum, we go on expeditions, which is a fancy word, it makes you feel really cool. You're like, oh, I was on an expedition. <laughs> but it's basically a backpacking trip, and um, they last from about 10 to 14 days, um, on which we carry everything we need on our backs. We camp in less than often, uh, less often ideal alpine conditions. We cook for ourselves on teeny tiny MSR stoves, and we trek through the most beautiful lands I have ever seen. So this is an example of our class inspection, my science class. And then this is the Utah. Um, but HMI is very much so a fully functioning academic school, and so while we were on Exped, we would have study halls, so we'd hike in the morning, about five to six hours, you come back and you do your homework. And when we were back on campus, we have classes six days a week from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. With, with breaks for lunch and dinner. So very, very busy. Um, and after this talk, if anyone is, has any questions about logistics, especially any freshmen who are interested, if you're not interested, I won't <laughs> yeah, but if you are interested, <laughs> um, I would love to talk to you more about it because I by no means just ended up here. I put a lot of work and research in, and to be totally honest, I'm scared out of my mind. I mean, the longest I had ever gone camping was for one night, <laughs> and the longest I'd ever been away from home was two weeks. This program was four months, so you can imagine what I was about to get myself into. I didn't even know myself. I'd, <laughs> I'd live away from family and friends, and I didn't know how to get on without them, but I was being pulled to Leadville. And no matter how scared I was or how hard I cried on August 20th when I left and I got on that plane, I went. And it has been the best decision I've made in my life since. Or today, not since. I'm not <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd like to take this time to let you in on a moment that I feel really encapsulates my age and my experience. The story takes place on my second expedition um, that set off in early October, and this particular expedition was the coldest expedition. Um, we experienced temperatures at night from around negative 20 to negative 25, and the morning is around 35 to 40, so it's a little, a little nifty right there. <laughs> and expeditions are strenuous enough, we hike a lot, we carry about 60% of our, whoa, 45% of our body weight on our backs, which for me is roughly 60 pounds. So and you're going up and down a lot, and it can really start to wear on you, and now you add in the weather, and it can really be difficult. Um, in my expedition, there was a girl who really felt this difficulty. Um, she's one of my good friends now. Her name is Lily Hannah Meyer, and she's from Brooklyn, New York. Um, Lily definitely struggled with the weather and with the rigor of our route. She's a very petite person and struggled with her pack and wasn't wasn't keeping up with the group, and I could definitely tell it was starting to wear on her as it would anyone. But on the seventh day of our expedition, we encountered an obstacle that slowed even the fastest hikers. We, on day six, 
were camped just below the southern ridge of Mount Maxo, so only 12 feet shorter, just to recap. <laughs> <laughs> um, we were camped southern ridge, and that next morning we were going to attempt to summit. So we wake up on our seventh day at 4 a.m. in the pitch dark and cold. Everyone is blind as a bat, like crawling through their stuff, trying to figure out where everything is. And we pack these bags and call them impossible bags. It's basically all layers you could ever possibly imagine to me in any given situation. And they all fit into like this big, so it's pretty impressive. Anyway, um, so we were packing and we all congregate in a circle up at the front to meet our instructor to get ready to set off. And it starts to flurry. And we all look around each other and you hear whisperings and somebody turned to me and goes, it's flooring down here, can you imagine what it looks like up there? Um, but our instructor turned to us very seriously and asked us if we still wanted to go. And everyone immediately said, oh yes, we still want to go. Um, but it was made very clear that at any point someone felt uncomfortable, we would turn around, no questions asked. And so we set off. And we were about three hours in, and the higher you got, and the colder it was, and the harder the snow fell, and it got to the point where it was basically like you were walking in a milk carton. You could not see anywhere in front of you. The wind was pelting you, the snow. I don't know if anyone's seen my Facebook photo, but like your hair, my hair in this instance, it was encased every strand in ice, and I started crying a little because it was very <laughs> strenuous and my eyelashes froze together. Um, so just to give you, it give you some, yeah, how it was feeling. Um, but we were three hours in and everyone was feeling it. It wasn't just the ice anymore that was hitting us or encasing our hair, but we were hunched over, it was, we were tired, this was a long, long, hard hike. And we couldn't feel any part of our body. I couldn't feel my arms, I had to have an instructor put a jacket on me and I've never felt more helpless in my life. Um, but around three and a half hours, we were walking in a line and I had lost a sight of Lily. Um, we were called to stop by our, our instructor and as we sat there waiting and huddling for her to come and catch up with us, we saw her coming and she just was doubled over and as she got closer you could see that there were tears frozen to her face and what happened next is something that I will hold with me for the rest of my life. We all just immediately went to her and embraced her and told her she could do it. And <coughs> we placed her at the front of the line, so we were all behind her, following her at her pace. And a couple of the faster hikers, my a guy friend of mine, Raphael included, he they all went to the back and I won't say singing because it's not the right word, but they started a very loud rendition of Let It Go from Frozen. <laughs> really going for it. And so there we were, almost 13,800 feet up in a full on blizzard, dying laughing. <laughs> and we made it to the top, and I can tell you that yes, it is cool to stay 14,000 feet above the sea, but I think that my favorite part of this memory was the 10 steps right before the summit when I looked up to see Lily leading the way and I looked behind me to see all my friends singing in the back and we were all together almost there. And so that's my favorite part. <laughs> um, but I guess I'm up here today <laughs> to implore you to go after whatever it is you wish to create for yourself and to make an adventure and let it lead you on grander ones down the road. Live long and prosper, thank you. <laughs>